More machines, less manpower. Automation is increasing, but are humans paying a price for progress with their jobs? This is Roundtable with me, Vanessa Cudderford. As technology advances, we're building machines capable of doing more. But is the pace of change too fast? Does the focus also need to be on adapting human roles to maintain workforces and economies? Productive and accurate. For centuries, machines have been snapping at the heels of humans. In some industries, they've replaced traditional manpower. But as an artificial intelligence dawn draws ever closer, do they have the potential to make many human jobs obsolete? Or is the phenomenon nothing new? And if greater automation is inevitable, is the global economy ready for the rise of the robots? The increase of automation during the Industrial Revolution saw productivity rise. Machinery was, came in to basically save labour, that is, replace workers or at least make them more efficient in, in the production of goods. Fear of job losses to the hands of machines prompted the Luddite movement in Britain in the early 1800s. Uh, so what they did was they broke machines. Um, they would sabotage machinery um, uh, to make sure it couldn't be used and so the workers would continue having to go to work. Over the years automation has reduced human working hours and it's changed the makeup of some industries. In 1900, 40% of employed people worked on farms. Today, that number is less than 2%. With automation generally reducing the cost of production, products can become cheaper and there's potential for more profit. Are we at risk of losing our jobs to robots? According to the International Institute of Robotics, fewer than 10% of current jobs could be done by a machine. But other research says 30% of jobs in the UK are at high risk of automation by the early 2030s. Another study says almost every major American metropolitan area will lose the majority of its jobs to automation in the next 20 years. We already have self-driving cars, drones that can deliver goods on their own, computers that diagnose disease and legal services provided by algorithms. As computers become self-learning and able to tackle more complex tasks, will they be able to do a greater variety of jobs in the future? The computing power that's available makes it clear that it is entirely likely that a lot of professional creative tasks um, can be automated. As automation increases, so too do developments in artificial intelligence. Combined, could they be capable of things humans believe only they can do and our economies and governments prepared? Well, I'm joined at the round table today by Executive Chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute, Yaron Brook. Also with us is Rob Lugg, he's a trade union activist here in the UK, and Anne Pettifor, she's the Director of the Economic Policy Research Organisation, Prime Economics. Thank you all for joining us here at the round table. Rob, I'm going to come to you first. Optimists say that technology leads to more jobs being created rather than destroyed. Do you agree? I mean... What we are seeing at the moment, actually, uh, certainly in this country, um, has actually been a lack of investment, I think, in technology being developed and a mass creation of low paid and secure jobs. Um, those have been substituted instead of uh, developing technologies. Um, obviously, d development of new technologies and the effects that has on the workplace is something that working people have always been aware of, but actually, I think we're entering a different phase now where it's not just going to create uh, new jobs. The, the potential is that it will get rid of jobs at such a fast pace and in such a massive way that this could uh, impact the whole future of work. But it's those low paid rote work jobs that disappear, allowing people to do better pay, perhaps more interesting jobs, Anne. Well, that might be the case, and it is certainly true that a lot of routine jobs have been replaced by machinery, and, for example, in agriculture that may, ha may, may happen. 
But the fact is that people need to be able to work and they need meaningful work in order for us to maintain stability, social and political stability. And that's going to have to be a big issue for politicians and policy makers. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that, Yaron? Look, I, we've been hearing the same story for over 200 years. Uh, every time there's a new technological innovation since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, there's been panic in the streets, we're going to lose jobs. And it's never happened. The fact is that there are more people globally working today than ever in human history at actual jobs. Uh, there's more opportunities. There's a more diverse workplace. They're much more fulfilling jobs today than they were in the past. In the United States, 150 years ago, 90% of the population worked in agriculture. Today, it's less than 1%, and yet we produce lots more food. The same is going to happen with manufacturing. Manufacturing jobs are going to go away. Robots are going to replace them. But that's a good thing. These are rot jobs. These are boring jobs. And what they're going to be replaced with is the ability of individuals to choose more fulfilling, more meaningful jobs in the future. Now, this somewhat depends on our ability and our educational system and our educational system's ability to keep up. So, so that, is a, that is a constraint. But I, I think we're way, we've always been way too pessimistic about technology and about the future. And, and that's to your point, isn't it, Rob? It is about people keeping up with change because, OK, perhaps jobs will be better for society as a whole, more interesting, but you look at what happened in the Welsh coal mines, for example, when a whole society, whole villages lost their way of life. And that's a worry, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's the, uh, a, a big trend that's different over the last, say, 40 years uh, of uh, these changes taking place. Uh, and you only have to go to the Rust Belt in America uh, or to, as you say, the Welsh Valleys here, places like Sunderland, um, another place in the north which I've, I've been and visited and talked to people there. And what's clear is the, the deindustrialization has thrown large numbers of people uh, out of work and out of previously secure, well-paid jobs that they were able to support their families for, and, and, and nothing has come to replace it. Um, and I think that is a, a, a huge problem and, and it's thrown up the kind of political response to that has been here, the vote for Brexit, um, now the, the, the and then le later, ironically, the swing the other way to, in the vote for the Labour Party and their increased vote in uh, this year's election. Uh, I think that, you know, these are huge challenges facing us and things are not just happening as they always have done for, for a couple of hundred years. That's an interesting thought. So you think then that automation is partly to blame for these sort of shock political events rather than globalisation? Well, I think both. I think you can really separate those two things from one another. They're both driven by the desire to reduce costs and to weaken the bargaining power of labour uh, in, and, and tilt the balance in favour of capital. And that's what we've seen, you know, a massive uh, increase in power and wealth by a very tiny proportion of the top of society, more inequality uh, 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 in terms of that gap between rich and poor today than there's ever been before. So what strategy... Oh, Anne, yeah. Yeah, no, I was going to say, the problem is also the pace of change. Mm. So there, I think the rate of change right now is, is, is perhaps faster than it has ever been in history. And that is very unsettling for societies. Uh, the need to adapt to change is really important if we're going to modernise our economies. But, but we cannot make that adaption, adaptation, should I say, unless there is a pace which is manageable by society. And of course, you know, the, the great minds behind this new technology, all they want to achieve is the lower costs, uh, lower wages, more flexible workforces, all of those things which are attractive to capital but deeply unattractive to societies which are deeply kind of, you know, uh, based in cultures and, and, and in norms uh, that really have been destroyed. So I think we need to worry about the pace of this change because it's inviting a backlash, uh, as Rob says, there's a backlash against the rate of change as much as against change itself. Yeah. So what strategies then, Niran, should governments be putting into place to ameliorate those hazards? Well, I don't believe there are hazards here, so I don't believe governments should be putting into place anything. I think I, think I, I would attribute the, the, the problems that, that's uh, been expressed here to other causes and not to technological change at all. I think technological change is uniformly positive. It's a uniformly benefit to society. The fact that there are fewer coal miners today, we should be celebrating. It's a very dangerous job. It's a dirty job. They got lung cancer. It was not a pleasant environment. The fact that we have fewer farmers today, particularly subsistence farmers, 
is a good thing. The fact that we can take dangerous manufacturing jobs and put robots in their place is something to be celebrated. You know, we forget that over the last 30 years, and again, if you take a global perspective, somewhere between a billion to two billion people have come out of poverty. This is according to the UN, not, not my numbers. Uh, it, all these things are to be celebrated, technological change, technological advancement, the faster, the better, the more it enhances human life. We all walk around today with supercomputers in our pockets, computers more powerful than the computer that sent man to the moon, and yet we're complaining constantly about technology. But technology is wonderful. It's, it's enhanced our life tremendously. Uh, you know, in my view, <coughs> if governments, I mean, we face obviously societal challenges, I think the, the solution is to get government out of the way. I think out of the way of markets, out of the way of technological advancements, and out of the way of, of innovation in, in education. I think what's holding back our educational institutions is an educational bureaucracy that, that constrains the ability to innovate and to, to be creative on educational front. But that's exactly what has happened. Governments have been got out of the way. Governments have been marginalised. Governments are no longer important to these processes. And it's all been decided by the invisible hand, by the market. And as a result is social backlashes. And the result is greater protectionism. The result is a reaction. The result is the rise of fascism. And the problem with the rise of fascism, and we saw 60,000 fascists Marching, marching through the streets of Warsaw at the weekend, is that that builds the kind of walls which make new technology impossible, that makes change impossible, and that takes us backwards. And so I think those who are utopian about the dreams of technology, those who are utopian about having a workless workforce, about having a society with no work and the machines doing it all, are ignoring, you know, Pro proper old basic politics and that is the problem people need to work to have meaning in their lives and if we deprive them of work and we know for example that in Africa there's very huge numbers of unemployment and there's also a birth rate which is very very high those people are going to move and they're going to move in ways that will be very unsettling both for their own cultures but for other cultures because unemployment forces you into moving if you have no choice to, uh, and no other way to find uh, to make a living. Yeah, so well, let me be very clear. I'm not advocating and I'm not utopian about a society of no work as, as, as Keynes was, for example. I believe technology creates more work, more jobs. Again, given the technology of the last 250 years, there's more work today, more meaningful work, more high paying work, more satisfying well, work today that, than that there that ever the was. And in a, well, but Africans or don't in have Middle work. East. Africans and Middle East don't have work because they have their own internal problems, because they don't respect property rights, they've not adopted the invisible hand, they have not adopted markets. When African societies do indeed adopt private property and, and the elements of capitalism, they create work just, just as China never used to have work, and today they employ a billion people. India China's had problems always had work. work. That's not the true. They were subsistence no, farmers, no, no, no. and they were starving in the farms. But what and do you 60 do? 60 million people starved in farming uh, during the 1960s. Okay. We can pretend that didn't exist, but that was before technology, a, a, a freedom, and technology was allowed, private property was allowed, which creates jobs. And that's what Africa needs desperately. If you don't want them to immigrate, then let's bring the ideas that made uh, uh, you know, advanced society possible in the West. Let's bring those ideas to Africa. That would solve the African problem. What would you say? I mean, what I'd say is what's actually led to a massive reduction in poverty in, in China, which can't be disputed, is labour. It is the work of millions and millions of Chinese people. Uh, 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 and a communist government. Uh, that, that have uh, worked in uh, factories producing goods for the West. Um, that's largely been the driving factor. Now, I, I mean, I personally so think that you can't think about these issues and you can't think about inequality without uh, and just think about stuff in your own country. If we're talking about countries like uh, Africa and other parts of Asia that have still to see those kinds of reduction in poverty and development, actually aut automation and its effect on industry is that there won't be manufacturing jobs uh, by the middle of this decade, they, they, they think there might only be two or three million people working in manufacturing because so much of it will have been automated. So manufacturing won't be able to be a, 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 a have that effect on those countries. So how do you, how does development economics work in sure. that situation? And, and to me, actually, the question is about how capital is owned, that we have to revisit these questions of who owns the technology, who owns the AI, who owns all these new uh, automation technologies that are coming through. Mm -hmm. And if they're owned in private hands, then 
uh, then it's not going to benefit us. The real problem, and I think the real utopian nature of this debate, is that we can go on extracting from the earth the assets that we need to build machinery and automated um, activity. Uh, we have to keep uh, extracting scan scandium, for example, from Madagascar, or cobalt from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, <coughs> or lithium from Bolivia. Now, the idea is that those, those resources are limitless, and we can just go on doing this forever to the earth, and there'll be no consequences. I grew up in a small gold mining town in South Africa, and when I was growing up, there was a boom in gold. Uh, there was a lot of gold. Today, it's a ghost town. We've, we've mined all the gold that there is, right? What we forget about is that there's a finite supply of the assets that create this machinery, and we can't go, move towards a totally automated society on the basis of using finite resources, finite, the finite assets of the earth. And that, for me, is the crucial thing. That's the thing that is delusional about the notion that we can automate all activity and remove the importance of work from society. But, Yoram, would you say that perhaps some of those advances might get rid of some of those problems? Of course. I mean, and, I mean again, we've heard this uh, uh, limited uh, natural resources story for 200 plus years, and there is no limited resources. Uh, as long as the human that is mind, ridiculous. as long as we have imagination. I mean, read Julian Simon, the great economist from the United States, who wrote a book called Unlimited Resource. The only, un the only resource that's limited is the human imagination. Imagine sending spaceships to mine uh, other planets. I mean, it, it, the idea that we have limited resources has been debunked over and over again. We've had peak oil every kind of decade, and then you have fracking, and suddenly there's no peak oil anymore. So technology is exactly what makes resources unlimited. And look, again, I'm, I'm for work. I, I agree completely that it is essential for human existence to work. What I'm saying is technology creates more work, more opportunities. My children are both, are both in the entertainment business because we are now a wealthy enough society that we can actually have thousands, maybe millions, of entertainers, uh, uh, hundreds of, of cable television stations, mm. for example, where people are employed that didn't exist Sure. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 but years ago. But what do you do in a place like Vietnam, like Thailand, where some 56% of people are employed in garment manufacturing? And when that uh, you know, moves over to machinery, how do you suddenly get 56% of people into a different job? Look, the, the idea that anybody can predict the jobs of the future is ludicrous, but the fact is that China's already losing jobs to Vietnam and these other places because China's becoming a more advanced, uh, advanced economy. And they're replacing those jobs. There's no massive unemployment in China as a consequence. But the idea that I can predict for you, I, I could have never predicted that gaming the programming of games for playing on, on computers and on that would be a massive industry employing hundreds of thousands of programmers. Just 10 years ago, I don't think anybody would have predicted that. There are lots of industries that we cannot imagine today which will come about in the decades and, uh, of the future that will employ millions and millions and millions of people. I have no question in my mind that if Africa engaged in the right policies, and that China continued to liberalize the economy and did the right things, and there are no, no communists in China anymore, uh, if they actually did the right things in China, that there is no limit to the number of jobs. Uh, human needs, human wants are infinite. We always want more. I mean, who, who would have thought that we need, uh, literally need, a smartphone? I mean, you can't get, a lot, you can't get in life without it. So in 10 years, what will we need? We'll need a lot more and a lot different things, and there will be people making it and, and people engaging with their minds, okay. their imagination to create those OK, things. but the problem is we, don't, we can't imagine what those needs are going to be. Mm -hmm. And so how do governments put strategies into place now without knowing what the future holds? I mean, f for me, it's, it's, it's not just a solution of governments. I, I, I don't just want to see, uh, obviously, I, I, well, I guess you can guess from what I've said, I'm opposed to neoliberalism and, uh, uh, and want to see a different kind of society. But I don't just think that that's a question of putting a different set of people in power or a, di a different set of people in control of the mechanism of government or, or, or of the ownership of capital. I think it's actually about democratising those things. Uh, I think a big thing that the, uh, out my movement, the trade union movement, has to get to grips with um, is the way to tackle automation, uh, and globalisation and their effect on our members' jobs uh, is not to resi either resist uh, technological advancement or, or, or you know, globalisation uh, or to um, just go along with it and allow those jobs to be destroyed. It's actually to revisit 
uh, w whether our members should be the ones owning and controlling those resources um, and collective ownership forms. You know, uh, the big scandal at the moment, Uber, one of the biggest disruptive technologies uh, in terms of uh, automation and, and, and new technology, uh, a big scandal in London that it's potentially going to lose its licence. Actually, uh, why not set up a, a cooperative owned by the drivers and maybe also service users um, to take the benefits of Uber, but actually uh, distribute the, uh, the, the potential gains from it to much wi more widely than just a few venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. And there are a lot of ideas about how we might cope with this revolution. Robot taxes, universal basic income. What do you think about those things, Anne? Well, I still think they're delicious. Delusional, really. I mean, I'm against the UBI. I think the idea that you'll have people not working and just be able to find money out of the blue sky to pay them is a delusion. Um, but it's part of this whole notion that we w should move towards a w workless society and leave it all to machines. And I'm, I'm strongly in favour of technology, and I do understand that technology has brought good change and jobs. But I think right now we're going through a phase where the, the, the dominant view is that uh, the maximum amount of rent can be extracted from people and assets by uh, mechanising uh, all aspects of the economy. And that way, for example, you can sit in California with a piece of software and extract 25% from every car ride that takes place around the world. The idea of effortless income generated from machines is absolutely fundamental to today's capitalism and is what makes today's capitalism so very different from the more innovative capitalism of the past. At the moment it is incredibly exploitative and wants to exploit without effort, without investment, by sitting in uh, with a bit of software in one place and extracting the labour and value that are created by others for the purposes of the rent seeker, of the rent gouger, you know, gouging rent from every piece of land, from every piece, from every asset and from every uh, labourer. And that, for me, is the problem with today's capitalism. Jerome, what would you say? It's I all mean, about growth. Is growth necessarily desirable? Ultimately? Yes, absolutely. And, and, but to me, it's astounding to the idea that, that, that to tell the, the programmers at Uber that are working until 2 a.m. in the morning and you can, you can see the lights in their windows when you drive in Silicon Valley, oh, that on. they work. No, absolutely. Uh, I've lived in Silicon Valley. Um, the, the, the idea that it's effortless, the, the, the amount of energy and the amount of imagination. I mean, who would have imagined just three years ago that we would have Uber? And here we have revolutionized transportation all over the world. They have competitors in China, they have competitors in the United States with Lyft, and, and, and we, we, you know, they're extractors of rent and exploiters. They, they, have, they have added immense value to our society. These are the heroes should be celebrated, not, not well, you condemned. You tell that to the drivers in London. Well, the drivers don't you know, have to be Uber, right? The, here's, they another, no, here's an additional source of income they that they no have generated. They have no choice because there are very few jobs, and the jobs that there are are insecure and incredibly low paid, and people having to take one or two or three jobs. Unemployment in order to in survive. The is at the lowest it's ever been. Yes, it, it's, 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 it's very, very low. It's low, but it's very low grade as well. well. It's low paid and low grade employment, and people are having to do one, two or three jobs to survive in a society where actually their costs are not falling at the same rate as they were. Isn't it great that Uber allows them to take that additional Let's job? Hear from uh, and we've got a crisis of productivity, not to, men not to mention that. But, I mean... I don't dispute that, that programmers play an in incredibly important role. I, I, I know some friends who work in uh, UI design and, and stuff like that, and they're incredibly exploited, often self-employed and uh, treated really badly by companies like Google and Uber. Absolutely, they should be part of the cooperative that owns the, the platform. It's the Peter Thiels of this world um, who I think contribute nothing meaningful to the world. Uh, you know, just an, exa and the, an example of the response to this is, is what's happening with Tesla, where the workers who are the real ones creating those cars and uh, creating the technology and, and, and creating the value um, are, are seeking to unionise in defiance of... Um, uh, in defiance of their boss. Uh, I think that's the, the important thing here. Uh, the, the, there's a fundamental dis, un, uh, unbalance of power within the modern economy, uh, and that has to change. OK, briefly, in a couple of sentences as we wrap up, how do we ensure, then, that the benefits of automation are for everyone, not just for the few? 
Well, I think, I think the more we embrace free markets, the more we get government out of the way, the more we reduce regulations and innovation and reduce taxes, and we allow the free market to actually work, productivity then increases. Productivity is, is suppressed by government regulations and government controls and a lousy tax system. If we free up the market, we will see exactly the outcome. And I want to live in a democracy. I don't want to be governed by markets. I want to be governed by people that I've elected who have my interests in my society's interests and my children's interests at heart. The market does not have those interests. The market has the interests of the few, the 1%, that control the markets at heart and not the people as a whole. So I don't want to live in that nirvana where, is, where the market determines and is our government, but we are never able to elect the market or vote for the market. Okay. And that's for me is not a democracy and I don't want to live there. Two very different versions and visions of the future. Thank you all for joining us on Roundtable. In many ways, machines are faster and more accurate than humans, but perhaps we need to take care to ensure that technology works for all of us. That was Roundtable with me, Vanessa Cuddeford. Thanks for watching.